One season ago, the Boston Celtics finished the regular season as the three seed with a record of 48 and 24 and reached the Eastern Conference Finals, where they took the Miami Heat to a highly contested six game series. Now, just six months removed from those very Eastern Conference Finals, the Celtics sit at sixth in the East with a record of 16 and 17 and have lost six of their last 10. This begs the question what is wrong with the Boston Celtics? The first issue with the Celtics this year has simply been availability. Arguably the four best Celtics this season have all struggled to stay on the floor. Kemba missed the first 11 games of the season with a left knee injury and has missed five games since his initial return on rest. Just seven games after Kemba returned to the lineup, Marcus Smart went out with a calf injury. Smart has missed the season's last 15 games and is still inactive as of right now. Jason Tatum was absent from five games in the middle of January because of COVID-19 protocols, and Jalen Brown also missed two games due to a slight knee injury in early February. And as a whole, the Celtics' four-man lineup of Kemba Walker, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, and Marcus Smart have been healthy for only a total of two games this season and have spent a grand total of 28 minutes together on the floor. For context, 54 Four more four-man lineups have played more minutes on the floor for the Celtics than this four-man lineup. The next biggest issue for the Celtics this season has been Kemba Walker. To say the least, Walker has been a shell of himself this season. First, Kemba is shooting the worst from the field since his rookie season. In his rookie season with the Bobcats, he shot 36% from the field. In this season with the Celtics, he's shooting 37.5% from the field. Second, Kemba seems like he's lost a little bit of aggression, a little bit of a burst, and a bit of a desire to get to the rack in general. Kemba's only attempting 10.4% of his shots from inside 3 feet, a career low, and he's also only attempting 3.3 free throws per game. This season, he's averaging the lowest free throw rate of his entire career. But he's also been largely ineffective with the ball in his hands as a facilitator this season, averaging a career low in assists per game with only 4.2 a night. Now, with Jalen Brown commanding more touches because of his improvement as a playmaker and ball handler, and Jason Tatum continuing to command touches because of his growth as a scorer, I will concede that being a big-time playmaker in this offense isn't really Kemba's role. Kemba's role on this roster should be to just simply take pressure off of the two stars and be a reliable shooter and closer. Interestingly enough, he hasn't even been a reliable catch and shooter this season, which is the absolute least you could ask of a primarily off-ball point guard. Kemba has seen a dramatic drop-off in his catch and shoot percentages from last season, going from 40% on his attempts last year to 33% on his catch and shoot attempts this year also a career low for Kemba. But as I mentioned earlier, the most important aspect of Kemba's game in his career and to the Celtics has always been his closing ability. I mean, he hit one of the coldest shots in college basketball history to ice the Big East championship for the Huskies. Sadly though, Kemba has failed to resemble that cold-blooded killer that we once saw back at UConn and in Boston. Last season with Boston, he averaged 5.5 fourth quarter points per game on 43% shooting from the field and 43% shooting from deep. This season with Boston, he is only averaging 4.5 fourth quarter points per game on 34% shooting from the field and 30% shooting from deep. And in clutch situations, late games where the score is within 5 points, Cardiac Kemba has failed to show up, and we see another steady decrease in his percentages from last season. Last season in clutch moments, he shot 35% from the field, but was at least a reliable three-point shooter, shooting 41% from deep in clutch situations. This season, Kemba is shooting 23.5% from the field and just under 17% from deep in clutch situations. But I'm not just ready to put it all on Kemba. The Celtics offense this year has struggled as a whole and has simply not moved as fluid as it did last season. In the 2020 campaign, the Celtics ranked as the 5th best isolation scoring team in basketball by points per possession and ran the 8th most isolation plays. 
This year, we have seen a dramatic decline in their isolation scoring ability. They run even more isolation plays this season, the fifth most in basketball to be exact, but have been absolutely horrid compared to last year, ranking as the seventh worst isolation team by points per possession. Now, I do think Kemba factors into this equation ever so slightly. With Walker out, teams have been able to key in on Brown and Tatum, and with Kemba struggling as an off-ball shooter, teams can afford to gamble a little bit more when collapsing on the ever-dangerous duo. But like I said, all of the Celtics' offensive struggles cannot just be put on Kemba. This season, the Celtics have failed to move the ball in general, ranking 28th in assists per game, 29th in potential assists, and 30th in secondary assists per game. Now, Tatum is still a lethal scorer, and Jalen Brown has taken a massive leap in all aspects of his game, as a playmaking ball handler, a shooter, and just developing a killer instinct to get to the rack and attack. But ball movement is where I do put a little bit of the blame in Brown and Tatum's hands. Tatum and Brown have this horrible habit and tendency of getting tunnel vision when driving to the rack and getting into the lane, and putting up a contested shot, when there are wide open shooters in the corner or on the wings. This lack of passing vision from the duo has led the Celtics to rank 21st in three-pointers attempted this season, and when threes are so much more valuable and at a premium in today's NBA, the Celtics offense would excel if Tatum and Brown would simply improve their passing vision. As for Tatum more specifically though, he has slipped deeper and deeper into a bad tendency that he showcased earlier in his career, taking too many of those aforementioned mid-range pull-ups, and he has been much less than efficient this season on those attempts, shooting 36% from 15 to 19 feet, 39% on pull-up jumpers, and 34% on fadeaways. But you cannot put all of this on the Stars as a whole. Compared to previous seasons, the Boston Celtics just have a lack of depth. Last season, Gordon Hayward may have underperformed in the playoffs, but is still a smart ball handler and ball mover that helps slick the wheels of this Celtics offense. And two seasons ago, with Kyrie Irving at the helm, they had solid contributors like Al Horford, Aaron Baines, Marcus Morris, and Terry Rozier to help put in work night in, night out. This season, the guys who have been getting those minutes have been extremely underwhelming, and the two recent Celtics signees have been the absolute worst. Tristan Thompson has failed to protect the rim at a high level. This season, players are shooting 7.7% higher than their average field goal percent on Thompson this year, and 5.2% higher than their average field goal percentage on Thompson inside six feet. Jeff Teague has been a decent playmaker and off-ball shooter for the Celtics, but he's just frustrating to watch sometimes. He's made a lot of boneheaded turnovers this season and cannot finish inside or in the mid-range to save his life. He's shooting 31.3% from 3 to 10 feet and just under 17% in the mid-range this year. This year's first round pick for the Celtics, Aaron Neesmith, doesn't really bring any added value to the Seas outside of his shooting, and with the team's heavy isolation play, Neesmith has struggled to play off ball and move without the rock in his hands in general, all while shooting on pretty horrid efficiency, under 40% from the field and 35% from deep. Boston's second round pick in 2017, Semi Ojale, has struggled to really add any tools to his bag in his tenure with the Celtics. He's an okay defender, he's an okay ball handler, an okay shooter, he just doesn't really do anything exceptionally well. I'd say the one shiny piece on the Celtics bench has been Peyton Pritchard. He had some scoring ability and some tertiary ball handling, but he still has work to do to improve out of the pick and roll and as an overall playmaker. So this leads us to another question. What do I think will happen with the Celtics the rest of the way? Well, preseason I picked the Celtics to make the NBA Finals, and with how the East is shaken out this year, it's safe to say I won't be sticking with that prediction. But all isn't lost for the Celtics. I expect this rotation to get healthy and gradually improve chemistry-wise, I expect Kemba to get back to being at least a solid contributor, and for the Celtics to end up nabbing a top 4 seed. They're still a very good team, this has just been an extremely rough patch. And Boston has two of the best young stars in the NBA. If this year isn't the Celtics' time to compete for a title, I'm extremely confident they will still have numerous opportunities in the future. 
If you have made it this far in the video, I thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy content and basketball analysis like this, I implore you to subscribe and to check out our social media pages at NerdSesh on Instagram and at Nerd underscore Sesh on Twitter, as well as our other videos. My buddy Carson just released an excellent video on why Bam Adebayo was the biggest all-star snub. And if you want the biggest portion of our NBA analysis, I ask you to please tune into our podcast. We shoot three a week, two NBA shows, and one sports history show on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. And we will most likely be live right here on YouTube for two of those a week. I again thank you for watching, and I hope to see you soon.